You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's special episode, John is joined by David Spurgle. David Spurgle is the president of the Simmons Foundation. Through the Center of Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute, he continues his research interests which range from the search for planets around nearby stars to measuring the shape of the universe. Using microwave background observations from the Wilkinson Microwave Anisotropy Probe and the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, David and his colleagues have measured the age, shape, and composition of the universe. He currently co-chairs the science team for the Roman Space Telescope. Dr. David Spurga, welcome to the program. Pleasure to be here. Now, Doctor, today was the press conference resulting in the, essentially the, the, the methodology on how NASA might use its resources to search for UAP and add to the greater governmental probe into the phenomenon. Now, could you give us an overview of what assets NASA has that, that we could use? Because it struck me, I was looking at it thinking, well, the satellites are, may not be all that useful because they're science satellites that are not really designed for this or calibrated for it. So what do we have? In some ways, the most valuable thing NASA has is scientific methodology. It's understanding that when you don't understand a problem, you want to collect data or calibrate it. You want the data to be, you want to understand the instruments that's making the measurements. You want to have multiple sets of data and the ability to verify and have it depended on. Said that, you know, that are, you know, satellites monitoring the Earth or monitoring space that are optimized to get the, the large swaths of the planet, not to study in detail at a balloon. It doesn't have the, the spatial resolution to do it. But we recommend it for NASA to do is to really take advantage of the fact that it, it is a agency that you know, advocates a scientific method that focuses on openness and use them and bring that to the problem. And so most of them have many of them are collected, say, from military imaging. And the objective of the military is not to do scientific study. And in fact, any image taken by you know, an F-16 is classified because they don't want to reveal details of the camera. It doesn't matter what's in the image. You know, NASA has a program of collecting open data and uh, keep, keeping things available. So we talked about serving as a place that would collect in a systematic way reports from pilots. You know, we advocated that they consider uh, developing and releasing a crowdsourcing app. So if people see something, they take data. They record images. I mean, we're all used to these very fuzzy images of UFOs, and to, yet today we're all carrying around high-resolution, you know, really high-quality cameras on our phones. And you can imagine collecting images of an event from multiple angles, multiple people. You'll be able to infer velocities, acceleration, and figure out what's going on with a typical event. I anticipate most of the time it'll have conventional explanations, but if there's something unusual and exciting, you'll learn this by collecting the data. And I think this is also an opportunity for NASA to engage in, sort of, in citizen science, right? Which is if you have something you don't understand, it's not a mystery, it's not a conspiracy, what you want to do is collect data. And that's in many ways our overall message on, on the report. Now, with satellite constellations such as Starlink, just the enormous amounts of satellite coverage over the surface of the Earth in a, through a public means, can those be used or be made to be useful in the search? I don't think Starlink so much as I understand it. We're using it primarily for just communication GPS. But we do have a number of commercial and sometimes dual use imaging data collected. And some of that could potentially be used. I mean, I think we've seen the quality of that imaging from some of the press releases, uh, public releases associated with, say, events in Ukraine. So I think I mean, that is another potential resource. And a resource that NASA has that we talked somewhat about in the end of the report is, you know, the idea of we can look for techno signatures, as we have to call them. Right? This is, could we find the signs of an alien civilization around another star? And could we find 
evidence for, we know of all the landings that took place on the moon. Could we find the evidence for landing, another landing that was not ours? That's, in principle, fairly easy to do. You can go through all of the lunar imaging data and look for unusual anomalies. And uh, you should see Apollo 11, 12, and so on. But uh, ones that shouldn't be there would be very exciting. I mean, that's an example of something that would, I would view as sort of as a high-risk, high-return research. I think it's not likely to yield something, but uh, worth the time. And, you know, it could be worth someone's time if they can figure out a way to all the NASA archival data. Could you use an AI for that? For example, searching the lunar surface, is that going to have to be done manually, or can you just sift the data with an AI or machine learning and try and find something that way? Uh, you would almost certainly use, use some kind of uh, machine learning application for that. And you train it on the data we have, and uh, uh, it's, it's not going to be something that likely work right out of the box, but uh, it's a set of tools that people would likely use for the analysis. Now, this would be the greatest discovery in human history, so it seems worthwhile to do it. But there's also another aspect of this, which is atmospheric science. Many years ago, there was a UFO researcher, Dr. James E. McDonald, who was also an atmospheric scientist, an atmospheric physicist. And it seems to me that this might be useful not only to look for the reasons behind UAP, but new science as far as atmospheric plasmas and things like that. Do you expect that to be a fruitful area of research above and beyond trying to determine the origin of UAP if they are technological? I think it may turn out that a bunch of UAPs are some plasma atmospheric phenomenon, right? That could truly be... I, mean, I look at the history of things like sprites, right, which is effectively upward go and lightning. I mean, it's it's amazing. I mean, I would encourage you or listeners to, to, to Google lightning sprites and see the incredible images that have been collected. And those are things that were reported by pilots and not believed. And it only with improvements in imaging where people are able to capture the sprites. And they're a fascinating ionospheric phenomenon. Definitely look up images of sprites. They're amazing. So could there be something that's out there like sprites? Could there be something that we haven't seen before that are rare events, that uh, things like ball lightning that we've been missing and could capture? Absolutely. I mean, to me, that may be one of the most exciting, you know, I think that's a more likely outcome that we discover some uh, novel uh, physical phenomena. Well, I think that that's, it's, it's a dual science thing because it's open to anything. You're just trying to figure out what this 2 to 5%, I think, which is the number that Arrow puts on it, that 2 to 5% of things that aren't readily explainable but appear to be there. There's a signal among the noise. So it seems worthwhile for NASA to do this. But with NASA now putting a focus on technosignature research and looking for evidence of distant alien civilizations again. They once did this with SETI, but it got defunded over political stuff. And then there was the direct life detection missions on Viking that came back positive and the labeled release experiment. And that led to a shift towards follow the water and things like that. Do you think that by looking into UAP, there might be a danger to the overall search for technosignatures within NASA? And I think one has to be very careful. I mean, we're been very we try to be careful to not to say that we're looking for aliens but you know we're trying to understand anomalies and in a way i think of this as if you see something you don't understand you don't ignore it you collect more data on it and you also want to be cautious about jumping to conclusions right? you don't want to the, the idea of alien and if we had truly compelling evidence for the existence of aliens that would be the arguably the, as you said the greatest discovery you have to set a very high threshold before you, uh, for quality of data and repeatability and everything else before you would make some kind of claim like that. Well, it would be huge. It would be huge. But it's interesting to note that it's not impossible. You know, I mean, it's space is huge, yes, and all that. But there are ideas about von Neumann probes and things like that where you could have a close techno signature left over and on the moon and things like that. So it's it seems to me to be as, as, as worthwhile as SETI. You have to take a look or you're not going to find anything. But you might, by the way, find something you weren't aware of, such as really good data on ball lightning or something like that. So it just seems very worthwhile. Any civilization that we come into contact with, billion years more advanced than us. And I like to think about this in terms of going back in time to 1923, go back 100 years, and you talk about planes and cars and 
phones and they know those technologies. They see what we have today and think, hey, wow, things have advanced. You go back a thousand years to 1023 and they think you're a witch, right? That to someone from 1023, today's world would seem completely bizarre. So a step of a thousand years in technology is enormous and a million years is a thousand steps of a thousand years. So the idea that we should be looking for technologies that are similar to ours, to me, seems um, naive, which is why, you know, if you see something that likely looks like a, uh, a slightly more advanced drone, it probably means that the military or someone else is a slightly more advanced drone than you realize, not that there's an alien drone out there. If, if we were to see something, it might be incredibly advanced compared to us. Oh, there's no question. Because if, if an alien looks like you, it's probably not an alien. Um, and it, it's the closer it is to you, the harder it's going to be to prove that it's an alien. If you see if you see a techno signature 150 light years away, then that's that's alien. <laughs> you can reasonably say that. But if it's right here with you, maybe it's from your planet somehow. You know, you never know. Which is why you have to leave all the options open. But the one thing that people are going to ask about is why the director of this program was not revealed. What was the rationale behind not giving that information out? I mean, that's internal to NASA. That's not my personal decision. But I believe that they're concerned that the person is going to get harassed so much they want to protect them. Oh, that's certainly going to happen. There's no question that it's a heated issue, but that may not, just as a personal observation, it might not have been very helpful (laughs) because that was the one thing people were going to hang on and ask questions about, but it is what it is. So what is the future? Um, Can NASA now act more proactively? Will will you guys recommend that they act more proactively as far as building instruments specifically to look for UAP once we determine exactly what to look for? I mean, we, we laid out some recommendations in the report. I mean, you know, it's one of the challenges for NASA in all this, of course, is they have limited resources. We don't want the things they're doing with, you know, James Webb or exploring Mars or other things to do this. But we do think they're, at this stage, it's worth putting, you know, certainly resources in crowdsourcing, certainly resources into uh, data collection. Now, the crowdsourcing would be uh, relatively low cost, I would imagine, because you're just using people's cell phones for science. So that's a pretty cost effective way of doing it, I would think. That's going to be a big data set, though, I'll bet, wouldn't you think? Analysis is getting cheaper. So I think it might not be overwhelming, but you can think about all the images that you, all the, the data that, say, YouTube stores. Press. I, I, I think it's a doable problem at reasonable cost. All right, Doctor, thank you for your time today, and I look forward to some actual results. Uh, that'll be interesting to see. Yep, that'll, that'll be fun. Okay, a pleasure talking. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice.